Hash from Urban Species here again at the British Library at the Comics on Mars exhibition. I'm here with the legend Dave Gibbons. Hi. Before I did stuff for DC or IPC or, or whatever, you know, the, the kind of mainstream comics, I actually broke into the field by doing uh, fanzines and underground comics. And I was in a comic called The Trials of Nasty Tales, <laughs> yeah. which was a comic about a comic being put on trial for obscenity. <laughs> and that, that was, you know, really one of the very first things that I worked on. And um, I suppose it was a good example of comics not only being subversive, but actually reporting on their own subversiveness. <laughs> um, you know, it's kind of a, um, a, a dilemma with comics because I always think of comics as being subversive. And certainly my love for them as a kid was a way of expressing my individuality because, you know, when I grew up, comics were very much frowned upon as being either, <laughs> you know, crap American culture or the sort of thing you really shouldn't be reading, you should be reading real books instead. <laughs> and I think also the fact that they're really easy to produce, you can put your ideas in front of people very easily and traditionally comics have cheap, bad printing. So that's something that's very attractive. The dilemma is that now they're attracting cultural um, profile <laughs> that they tend to be called graphic novels and they tend to have higher production values yeah. which in a, in, a, in a way is great because it's reaching many more people but it slightly loses that subversiveness. I was one of the first British artists to go from mainstream British comics to mainstream American comics and they really wanted what we had in, in, in Britain that we understood comics that we knew how they worked but we didn't have the same reverence for the, the American characters that the American writers and artists did. And I think that was a real shot in the arm for the American comic book industry. I mean, what, I mean obviously when you, you and Alan Moore did Watchmen, it left this ginormous template that is now, it went on to American comics full stop and in a weird way, it's now now that American comics have become these big Hollywood things, it's actually become a big... All of Hollywood's heroes now have this subversive take that Watchmen had on a lot of heroes. Before you had things of people editing over, you know, what a character for a hero should just only act as a hero. Mm -hmm. When I'm talking 1920s kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, do you... Um, it's almost like for America, they have, they've come kind of full circle for them. But with yeah. Britain, it's it's a different kind. It's Britain mm. kind of not only reminding, but Britain's take. I mean, do you find um, that's well, going to lead into something else? Well, what was really interesting about a lot of early British comic characters was that they were actually villains. You know, there was a wonderful character called the Spider, who, strangely enough, and He's in the great. sidebar was actually written by Jerry Siegel, who was the creator of Superman. I didn't know that. That's a weird, weird thing. But that's the fact of it. There was also another character called Charlie Peace who used to be in the Buster when I was a kid who was this l lovable rogue he was a real Victorian murderer he was a <laughs> terrible man but he was now a, 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 a hero and then you've got things like Mr Punch you know where it's the person who's against authority and I think what Alan and I tried to do with Watchmen was just to show another way of looking at superheroes, not to say this is how you should look at them, but you know, they could also be this, there could be these other reasons why you'd put on a mask, another reason why you want to run through the night and fight crime, rather than just, well, you're a good guy and you've got superpowers and that's what you're, you're, you're going to do. But I think to translate comic book properties to the, to the movies, you have to darken them up a bit, you have to give them a little bit of the kind of grit of reality to actually make them attractive to mainstream audiences. I think, you know, a tr I mean, look what they've done with Man of Steel, the, the Zack Snyder yeah. Man of Steel. His costume is still red and blue, but it's a dirty blue and it's a dull red. Yeah. So I think that's almost inevitable. And I think it's more of a parallel thing than a thing that's actually been taken directly from the comics. Your style is very refined and very, it's, it's slick, but at the same time, if you put your stuff against a slick Japanese, like a slick manga artist or a slick, you know, mm. American Marvel artist, yours is a very, it's all, I mean, there's almost like, a, not in a bad way, there's almost like a kind of a dullness to it. There's a, like a human I'll kind take of... I'll that point. as a compliment. No, that is a compliment. It's yeah, yeah. like, it's, um, say if I'm reading the Hulk bashing someone, you know, that is immediately, I'm way in escapist zone. If I yeah. re read your Hulk hitting someone, it will be on a human level, like very rela much more relatable thing. It's like a gut thing almost. Yeah, well, well, that's what I've always tried to do to make my stuff relate to reality. And you know, when you draw anything in a comic, you're drawing in code. And the best comic book artists to me, people like Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko, they draw in a way which is actually very unrealistic. 
but it obeys its own internal code. So once you take their view of the world, you then believe anything they, th they throw at you. And they also, to a degree, become invisible. And that's what I've always wanted to do, is not draw attention to my style. I'm much more interested in the content. And in a way, that did kind of reach a peak with something like Watchmen, where I said to Alan, I want it to have a really simple page layout. I want it to be nine panels of page, so you don't notice its pictures almost. You just It's like you watch the theatre or you watch the telly. The frame ne never changes, so all you're interested in is, is what's going on in the frame. One of the things really is even when you're working within sort of fairly mainstream American comics to try and subvert what's ex expected. Um, I did a series with uh, Frank Miller, who, who's a very well-known writer of comics, Sin City 300, a thing called Martha Washington, which yeah. was about the adventures of a young girl from the ghetto Cabrini Green in Chicago and her adventures as she went through the world. I really enjoyed that book. Well, yeah. thanks. So I drew it as a young, a normally proportioned young woman, which kind of drew attention because <laughs> usually when they draw women in adventure comics, they're big strapping, big breasted Amazons, you know, and a lot of people found that rather innovative. I'd just drawn an ordinary decent girl, you know, stereotypes are always to be suspected. In many ways, comics are a boy's game and a lot of the artists and writers are boys and this is an ongoing discussion in comics anyway. I think what's really interesting is the success of manga, you know, Japanese comics, because a lot more young women read those than young men. Yeah. Because they don't tend to deal with the external stuff and the muscles and the breasts and the guns. They're much more internal, they're much more about human processes and human relationships. And I think that's seeping into Western comics. The, the other thing that's happened in, in recent years is the internet, you know, that you can now get published for free. Basically, yeah. your stuff can be up there. That, that, that was always the thing that I found when I was growing up, to actually get your stuff in print. And that was quite a hurdle to overcome because a publisher was investing a lot of money in these books. And there used to be places where you could break in, like say in 2000 AD, they had these short stories and they'd given a new writer or a new artist a chance. With the economics nowadays, there isn't, there aren't those gaps, there aren't those yeah. places where you can wheedle your way into the industry. But fortunately, there is the internet where you can publish your own work, get it seen. Deviant Art, if you look at the comics section on there, there's some wonderful stuff. And, and also, it's quite frightening to see the level that a lot of these people are at before they've even come to do it pr pr professionally. I think I'd have a hard time getting in now. Um, I'm involved with a company called Madefire and we do motion books where you can download our tool for free and you can make your own motion comics. Wow. And that, I, that to me was a wonderful breakthrough with this, that we're actually empowering the kids who would have been me, God knows how <laughs> long ago, but to, to actually give them the tools to do their work, to get it out there, to use modern technology. Like everybody else, when comics first came on iPads, I was quite skeptical, like, really, is it that good? And one of my best friends actually said something really interesting. He said, you know what? If we really care about this medium so much, we have to look at it logically. This is the future. Rorschach's Journal, October 12, 1985. What I found, as an old dog who always tries to learn new tricks, is that when you come to write a script for this, you're writing a script that is neither a comic script nor a movie script. Because you go, okay, page one, panel one, you think, hold on. There aren't really any pages. <laughs> there aren't really any panels. You, and how do you transition? In a comic, you just look and look, and that's the yeah. transition. What do you do? Do you cut from this picture to that picture? Do you fade this picture up, fade that one down? Do you move it across? And suddenly you become a whole new, aware of whole new areas of possibility for self-expression. So it's all the skills that you've learned doing comics, but actually inventing a new grammar of of telling stories, which is an evolution of comics. It's not a dilution of animation or movies. And it's really, really exciting because you've still got the balloons, you've still got the captions, you've still got the, the all, all the things you associate with comics, but you've got a whole new box of tools as well. And whereas, say, the biggest unit of thrill in a regular comic is, wow, a double page spread, we can do 360 <laughs> degree panoramas and it's yeah. mind blowing. So, no, I mean, much though I love traditional comics and, and I will always, you know, work in print media as well. It's really, really interesting to see the possibilities. And I know the people who are getting into it now are going to come up with stuff that we've never even thought of. So hopefully it's passing the baton on and seeing graphic storytelling going on to, you know, new fields and new possibilities.